A very good evening to all of you. I welcome you all to the ICANN initiative, the Hindu and Indian Express analysis. So we will start today with the quote of the day. The quote goes like this, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. So this quote was given by author and businessman uh, Harv Eker. Uh, he had written a book um, that's called as the secrets of a millionaire mind. So in this book, Secrets of Millionaire Mind, he has written this quote that the way you do anything is the way you do everything. So there he goes on to explain that uh, it's very common for us to press the snooze button every morning. And similarly, if today, if we are regularly going for a workout and we feel today that we are too tired or exhausted or we just don't feel like going for the workout, we might think that, okay, I'll do double workout tomorrow. But uh, these might seem very simple tasks like snoozing the alarm or just missing a workout. So these might uh, seem very simple because we have a tendency to think that either way I'm going to do double workout tomorrow. So it's not a big deal. But uh, what he says is the way you do anything is it reflects upon the way you do the rest of the things. So if you are snoozing the alarm, it shows that you lack the discipline, you lack sincerity and commitment to whatever you have to do after you get up. So uh, this is where most people lack and this is very important even for uh, from the UPSC point of view that uh, if we keep ourselves more organized, the way we keep our clothes organized, the way we keep our kitchen and house organized also reflects how organized we are and how systematic we are when, we, when it comes to studies. We uh, form a timetable and we stick to it no matter what. So uh, this is a, a discipline that we have to follow as far as UPSC is concerned. It's not just that, even in the ethics paper, you have a topic, uh, uh, say, like the public and private relations and lives and how they are linked and how it affects your uh, job. So in this, uh, it is not just about doing something. Like if you are a person who uh, is very short tempered and if you have the habit of shouting at people in your home on your family, then you will most likely go and shout uh, your subordinate, shout at your subordinates also tomorrow in the office. So that will give rise to a very bad work culture and it shows that you are not an emotionally intelligent person. Similarly, at home, if you are not used to treating the women members with respect and dignity, you are more likely to do so even at your workplace. So this again uh, is not a good work ethic. So it doesn't give rise to a good work culture. So that is why it is very important that whatever you do, uh, it gets reflected upon everything in your life. So uh, make it a point that in every aspect of your life, you are more organized, you're more sincere, disciplined and dedicated towards whatever you do. So with this, we will start with the first topic of the day, which is the impact of COVID on exports. So the first thing is the WTO data, which we had already seen in the starting days in April. So WTO data says that uh, the trade flows across the world may dip by anywhere between 13 percent to 13 32 uh, percent over 2020 so the trade flows may slip anywhere between 13 to 32 percent in 2020 so this was what uh, the wto day is about now we come to uh, the fall in the merchandise exports in india so the general merchandise exports have uh, fallen by 60 percent in the month of april and when it comes to textile, the exports of textile and the garments have fell by 91% in the month of April. Uh, even among this, uh, even when the exports have fallen by 60% in the month of April, there are only two uh, categories which have actually registered a positive growth. So one is the iron ore and the other is the pharmaceutical. Only these two sectors have seen a positive growth in the export while the rest of the others have seen a negative growth in the export in the month of April. So this shows the uh, impact that the lockdown has had on the exports. So now why, um, why is there such a steep fall in the exports? So first is that because of the lockdown, the demand uh, itself has fallen steeply. So the many people don't are uh, not getting their salaries, there are job losses, there are steep pay cuts. So because of this, the demand itself has decreased. The second is that because this uh, COVID crisis has affected all over the world, so therefore there is a disruption in the global supply chains as well. So the global supply chains have disrupted. So because of this also, exports are not possible. So then what, um, have, but then what measures have been taken to? 
sorry it's raining here a lot so you might hear some disturbance of the thunderstorms so several measures have been taken uh, one thing is that a uh, 15000 crore uh, liquidity facility has been given to the exim bank that is the export import bank a uh, 15000 crore liquidity facility has been given and the second thing is that when exporters are concerned uh, the maximum credit period that is available to them uh, from the bank side has been extended from 12 months to 15 months so some measures have definitely been taken to uh, boost the exports but nevertheless because of the lockdown and the demand crisis and disruption in the global supply chains the exports have fallen drastically but uh, then how does the future uh, what is the outlook for the future so the first thing is when we are looking at the current crisis we see that uh, many countries are putting barriers on the trade particularly uh, the medical uh, exports medical supply exports food supply exports so these barriers are will likely to uh, continue in the future as well at least for some more years so these barriers will again impede uh, the export at the international level second is there is also a tendency in the countries to look inwards so uh, now up uh, countries are feeling that it's because of globalization all these crises are happening so there has to be some control on the free flow of capital labor and everybody so therefore countries have started to look inwards and this again will pose a hurdle to uh, increase in the exports in the future the third thing is that uh, several countries now want to uh, go on the path of self reliance even india for instance has started the atmanirbhar bharat abhiyan which talks about uh, five pillars for a self reliant india so countries across the world are uh, now going on this path of self reliance which again means that they would be importing less so this again is a challenge in the future to improve and increase our exports so now we will go to the next topic which is about india china border issue we have already seen um, a lot in detail about the india china border issue so i am only taking what is new and what is different so um this article states that uh, there have been various instances in the past where china has uh, actually altered the uh, ground level positions where its troops are standing and also uh, china has time and again altered uh, its perception of where the border lies so for instance in uh, 1986 87 also there was this um, uh sundarong chu incident also so here again china had um, uh, changed the way it perceived the lac so after that uh, this dispute was again peacefully resolved so then in the year 1993 a border peace and tranquility agreement was signed so this agreement provided for two important things one is that the number of troops that both the sides will put across the lac is going to be limited and whenever there is a change in the number of troops that are going to be positioned at the lac then each of the countries will appraise the other that there is a change in the number of troops deployed in the border so these two important things uh, were agreed upon in the border peace and tranquility agreement of 1993 so um, but then what is the issue the issue has been that now whenever uh, these border standoffs are happening the most important way of trying to resolve them is a meeting of local commanders so these local commanders how do they meet up they will have conversation on hotlines which are established for this purpose and they will try to resolve the issues but uh, the problem that has been is uh, that's happening is that whenever the transgression is initiated by china so often the chinese side does not answer the call on the hotline for instance in 2013 uh, there was a standoff at dipsang and in 2014 there was a standoff at chumar so in both the sides in both these uh, times the chinese uh, local commander did not pick up the calls on the hotline so, so that we could resolve the issue so this is uh, because of this reason the issue is not getting resolved so when we talk of the conclusion you can just uh, speak about the wuhan spirit and the mamallapuram spirit according to which both the countries had agreed to resolve any border issues between them only bilaterally and also in a peaceful diplomatic manner so we will next topic which is india nepal relations so again the india nepal recent border issues we have already dealt in detail so only things which are new i'll be discussing now 
so first you have to understand and uh, even mention in your answers about the treaty of sagauli sugauli so this was uh, signed in 1816 between the east india company and between uh, india so uh, what they said was that it spoke about the border between india and nepal so under this treaty it was agreed that kali river would be the uh, border between india and nepal so this was clear before but what the, where the problem lied was where is the origin of the kali river so uh, after this treaty it was clear that kali river will form the boundary between india and nepal but the dispute are started arising because there were differences in where the kali river actually originated so let's see um, in the first case um, it was thought that there were actually several streams that were flowing from northeast and northwest and they would confluence at some point so the northwest stream was uh, through the limpiadura and the northeast one was the kalapani so originally this was limpiadura was considered to be the origin of the kali river but later on it kept on shifting shifting and uh, uh, it was considered that just below kalapani is the origin of the kali river so uh, and in 1947 when independence uh, was achieved so that time also it was broadly understood that kali river is just below the kalapani so uh, all the territories to the east of uh, kali river belongs to nepal so this was understood in 1947 during independence and that time nepal didn't have any problem it was with nepal's agreement that this uh, whole fact was agreed upon now we will look at some uh, the timeline so this was at independence in 1947 where uh, it was accepted by nepal that uh, there is this uh, changed boundary which had shifted from limpiadura towards the kalapani and india had inherited this boundary in 1947 so later on in uh, 1981 this uh, joint technical level boundary committee was set up so in 1981 joint technical level boundary committee was set up the purpose of this committee was now when the border between india and nepal was demarcated uh, several boundary pillars were set up but by 1981 several of these boundary pillars had become old and damaged so the main purpose of setting up this committee was to reidentify and replace these old and damaged boundary pillars along the india nepal border so this particular committee was dissolved in 2008 so before dissolution the committee told that 98% of the boundary is now resolved so it just left two areas unresolved so one was kalapani and the other was sustha so these were the only two areas which the committee left unresolved and which uh, is disputed even to this day so after this committee was dissolved it was uh, understood and it was uh, a common understanding was uh, arrived at by both the countries that any further issue on this would be discussed at the foreign secretary talk level so at the foreign secretary level talks um, this dispute will be further deliberated and issues are going to be resolved and in the year 2009 the current road construction which has become the point of controversy was started so this was a 80 km track from ghati bagar to lipu lake so this construction began in uh, the year 2009 and at that time nepal very much knew about this construction and it did not have any objections this is the whole timeline so what has been the nepal's action right now it has come out with a political map now so which is considering that the origin of kali river is from limpiadura and not from kalapani so because of this nepal has uh, added nearly 335 square kilometer of the indian territory into its political map which uh, was never reflected in any of the nepali political map for nearly over 170 years so in the last 170 years this area was never reflected as part of nepal in its political maps but now it has included that area as part of nepal in the recently released political map so that is Uh, we will move to the next topic which is india africa relations so when we talk of the india africa relations there are certain uh, issues which africa is facing in the recent times so one is the poor growth rate so even in uh, 2019 when there was no covid crisis africa grew at a modest 2.4% 
and now in 2020 uh, it is projected that uh, its growth rate will plummet anywhere to 2.1 percent minus 2.1 percent to minus 5.1 percent so it is in the negative growth uh, uh, territory so uh, this is therefore there is a very poor growth rate uh, in nepal sorry in africa that's the first issue the second issue is the regarding the disease burden in africa so uh, high rates of uh, uh, hiv malaria diabetes hypertension and chronic mal uh, malnutrition all these are prevalent in africa so this is another uh, issue that africa is facing third issue is that there is a steep decline in various commodity prices in africa for instance uh, when it comes to oil so nigeria is a producer of oil for instance so there is a steep decline in the commodity prices so this has uh, led to a decline in the economies of nigeria angola and other countries so this again is a cause of concern these are a few recent issues which countries in uh, africa are facing so when we talk of Africa's strengths, so several countries across the world, particularly India, China and all, they want, they are eyeing Africa and they are eyeing investments in Africa. So Africa definitely must have some very important strengths. One is that it is very rich in the natural resources. And when you look at the long term, it has that economic potential. So that is very important for uh, the, from the investment point of view. Next, it has a uh, demographic dividend that even India also enjoys so, so it has a youthful demography and fourth is that Africa as a continent has 54 countries uh, in this particular block so if you look at the influence that these 54 countries can have in various multilateral organizations that is going to be tremendous influence so this is another reason why uh, every country wants to have good relations with Africa so uh, when uh, those countries which are being for having good relations with Africa are looking for investments and um, uh, cooperation in mainly four areas. One is energy. Why? Because Africa is very rich in minerals uh, and also including oil and natural gas. So energy is very important and mining of these minerals. That is the second thing and infrastructure development in Africa because the level of infrastructure in Africa is poor and connectivity. So these are the four main regions where uh, countries are eyeing investments in Africa. And quite often whenever we talk about India's relations with Africa, it is more often than not compared with China's relations with Africa. It is said that China has a more aggressive uh, and exploitative relation when it comes to Africa. On the other hand, India has a more softer approach towards Africa that is um, directed at more developmental assistance. So let's look at the Chinese presence in Africa. So China has an annual trade with Africa that stands at 208 billion in the year 2019. On the other hand, if you see India's, it was 62 billion. So you can compare the two that how much more trade China has with the uh, African nations. And apart from that, China is investing in a big way in various infrastructure uh, projects in uh, Africa. For instance, uh, it has uh, developed the Addis Ababa, Djibouti and Mombasa Nairobi uh, lines it has developed. And also China is eyeing to develop the East Africa Master Railway Plan. So China is now eyeing to develop the East Africa Master Railway Plan. Similarly, China is also developing the Trans Maghreb Highway also and it is developing a hydropower plant in Nigeria. So various of these investments China is doing in Africa. So in the, uh, when it comes to strategic, uh, China is already now investing. Um, it has set aside more than 60 billion dollars for developmental assistance in, to the African countries. And also it has formed a $1 billion uh, infrastructure fund under the Belt and Road Initiative. So Belt and Road Initiative has its strategic implications as well. So $1 billion, fund, uh, $1 billion fund has been set aside by China for uh, Belt and Road Initiative in Africa. So when it comes to health diplomacy, now because of the COVID crisis, uh, China had sent several personal protective equipments and sanitizers and masks to various African countries. However, uh, this had later become a controversy because these supplies were considered to be very defective and poor quality. Now let's uh, see what has been India's role in Africa. 
so trade as i already have mentioned it is 62 billion dollars in 2018 and assistance also india has been doing uh, to various african countries in a big way so for instance the line of credit that india has offered to various african countries is itself more than 10 billion dollars and uh, in terms of security several african countries are faced with uh, various security threats radicalization and uh, terrorism and all that so in this area also the two countries are cooperating and uh, india africa forum summit uh, had uh, started from 2015 and it's an annually it is held alternatively between india and africa so this becomes an important forum where uh, the two countries uh, exchange their their cooperations and also their concerns so when it comes to training and education india plays a huge amount of role in uh, training the african uh, diplomats training uh, the african students as far as education is concerned india provides about 50000 uh, scholarships to the african students every single year so this is regarding training and education and when we talk about peacekeeping nearly 6000 indian soldiers are participating are deployed in various uh, united nation peacekeeping operations in africa so 6000 indian soldiers have been deployed there and even in terms of energy africa is part of our um, solar initiative also uh, between in, uh, the, the solar initiative also that because it lies Uh, across the equator and the tropic of cancer and capricorn so the solar energy has a very good potential and again various mining of various minerals and oil and natural gas so energy cooperation has been tremendous when it comes to technology again cyber security uh, is one very important area similarly we have the pan african e network for uh, e education and even e uh, health services that from india is provided to africa over the internet so these are some of the important areas where the two countries have been cooperating so now uh, what should india do in the days to come particularly that uh, india had planned for uh, a india africa forum summit this year but because of covid it is now postponed so in such a scenario what should india start doing so first thing that it should do is that uh, there can be a virtual summit so virtual summit of uh, various african countries india can have that so f- uh, first of all this will provide a platform where the countries can exchange uh, their efforts and the best examples for handling of the covid crisis so they can exchange their experiences and second this can also serve as a precursor to the actual annual summits that are to come in the future so uh, these two important purposes can be served by the virtual summit that we can have with africa the second thing is that um, india definitely is um, managing a covid and it is also now spiking in africa also so we can exchange uh, uh, these guidelines that uh, we are using to handle the covid crisis so regarding healthcare also we can constantly keep in touch uh after that uh, this arogya setu app and the e gram swaraj app for that we have um, now formulated for handling the covid crisis we can call that their technological as- uh, achievements and they can be shared with africa so arogya setu app and uh, even the e gram swaraj app they can be these technological achievements can be shared with africa and now uh, as i have mentioned that nearly 50000 scholarships will be given every year to the african students and now that these students will not be able to travel to india so we can expand e vidya bharati so e vidya bharati is nothing but uh, the tele education so this can be expanded and we can establish an india africa virtual university so that the education can go on unhindered irrespective of the pandemic next we can also help each other in the field of agriculture and food security so for instance now the locust swarms are devastating already the horn of africa and it has now come to india also so this can um, uh, worsen the food crisis that is already there so we can collaborate in this regard and we can ramp up our efforts and coordinated um, efforts in this so this also can be done apart from this uh, india should encourage various indian entrepreneurs to invest in africa 
so some of the important areas where india can encourage its entrepreneurs to invest in africa will be in the pharmaceutical sector and the healthcare sectors where africa is lagging behind a lot so apart from this um, as we all know that india already has a quad so quad comprises of united states india japan and australia so uh, we can have a quad plus so in this quad plus uh, this engagement has already started in which these four countries are now st- have started to recently engage other countries also like republic of korea vietnam israel brazil and all that so we can include several african countries which are bordering the indian ocean in this quad plus initiative so that maritime security issues can be discussed and uh, and all the strategic presence in that particular region can be discussed with the african countries so this is about the india africa relations we will now go to the topic which is regarding the migrant issue so again in the case of migrant issue we have already discussed a lot about this so the only reason why i am including this article is because of the name of the supreme court judgment so supreme court had given a judgment in alak alok shri vastava versus union of india case so in this case um, supreme court um, had gotten a report from the solicitor general about what the government is doing to handle the uh, to take care of the migrants when they had started to uh, panic and uh, you know start walking by foot and they wanted to go and reach their homes so that time the solicitor general had informed the supreme court that uh, the government is ensuring and will ensure that no migrant will go uh, shelterless or foodless and that uh, this panic is being created because of fake news so in that case the supreme court uh, seemed to agree with the uh, solicitor general's uh, argument and it said that the government is making its efforts and these are policy decisions in which supreme court doesn't want to interfere so this was the stand of the supreme court so this uh, was in the pil that was filed by alak alok shivastava versus union of india so in your answers it's very important to mention the uh, name of the judgments so that's the reason why i have included this particular article so what the uh, article also argues is that uh, what the supreme court has done in this case is an abdication of its constitutional responsibility so under article 142 of the constitution also supreme court has the power to undertake any measure to do complete justice so in this case also the uh, author argues that the supreme court should have taken measure under article 142 to ensure complete justice to the migrants because of this humanitarian crisis so what the supreme court by telling that uh, the government is doing its best is that it is kind of abdicating its constitutional uh, obligation also in fact the motto of the supreme court says that yato dharma tato jaya which means wherever there is dharm or justice only there there is victory so uh, by doing like this it is going against the uh, the court's own motto so this is what the uh, court uh, sorry the article is arguing and because this was a public interest litigation uh, that was filed with the supreme court so you can quote this uh, several times you can see a very common question that analyze uh, judicial activism and public interest litigation the utility of the public interest litigation so in one of the negatives you can say that uh, in several most critical important cases the pils have been um, ignored by the supreme court and have not been taken into proper consideration so this can be said and the article uh, um, in the concludes by quoting uh, martin luther king junior so it's uh, the court says that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere so this is an important quote which can be used in essay and ethics answer uh, i have used this quote uh, in my ethics answers also to begin something uh, i don't remember the question but i had used this quote in my uh, uh, exam paper that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere so this was a quote by martin luther king junior so you can use this in your answers at the same time uh, this quote i remember was given as an essay topic when i was practicing some mock essays so i had written an essay also on this particular topic like many essays these days uh, upsc is giving very philosophical uh, or just some quotes it is giving and it's asking you to write essay so i had written an essay also on this 
so um, i'd like to take um, <clears throat> this opportunity to urge that uh, every we can make it a point to write one essay so every sunday uh, my practice was every sunday was uh, dedicated for essay only like in the afternoon in, in the morning i used to spend 3 hours writing the essay and in the afternoon i used to spend 2 to 3 hours by researching on the topic and making all the value additions that is needed like some stories interesting stories anecdotes or some examples some book reviews quotes all these i used to search and uh, real life stories and all of these things i used to search and uh, i used to make a uh, make notes of all that so that if this topic or anywhere uh, areas nearby that come i'll be able to use this enriched material so use your weekends to write at least one essay uh, that will definitely fetch you better mark exam so the next thing we'll be looking at is the health issue so uh, the reason i included this article is only because there was uh, one important data in this so it says that um, in india the doctor to population uh, ratio is 1 is to 1445 but what the who is recommended is 1 is to 1000 so one doctor should be there for 1000 people but in india there is one doctor for 1445 people so this way it is said that uh, if india wants to achieve 1 is, is to 1000 ratio of pa doctors to patients then it will need to add more than 2 million doctors by the year 2030. So this is the important statistics that was quoted in this. And this particular article was actually arguing for a partnership with the private healthcare providers. So it is saying that uh, if India wants to achieve this ratio that is uh, recommended by WHO, then it will have to add more than 2 million doctors by the year of 2030. So this will definitely uh, require collaboration of the government with the private sector so how can government do this one is that uh, it has to encourage biomedical research by the private sector so the private sector has to uh, can step in and uh, uh, fill the vacuum that is there in the research and development area in the country second is we need to encourage uh, the private startups so these private startups can uh, invest in cutting edge made in india health related technologies so it offers these two measures how uh, government can collaborate with the private sector if you want to achieve that one is to 1000 ratio and at the same time of course set up more medical uh, institutions colleges which are of high quality and high standard so now we will be discussing yesterday's question i had given uh, the question was to uh, suggest measures for reviving the rural economy so uh, in this question first of all you have to identify uh, what rural economy comprises of so rural economy can be related to agriculture uh, or agro based industries transportation uh, construction and uh, even services like health and uh, education so all of these are various sectors in the rural economy so now you can deal with each of these and tell uh, steps that can be taken to revive each of these for instance agriculture uh, day before yesterday or uh, in this week itself we spoke of aria that is attracting and retaining uh, youth in agriculture where innovative uh, youth who have discovered or innovated something in agriculture are being rewarded and how their uh, skill development is being done similarly we have uh, encouraging direct farming uh, where farmers can directly sell to the customers so this will um, make agriculture more remunerative to the farmers then organic farming uh, can be uh, again is another important measure because uh, pesticides and fertilizers will not lead to making agriculture a more sustainable activity so in this regard you can give the example of patanjali jha sir about whom we had uh, discussed few days back so this again nature based farming zero based natural budgeting uh, sorry natural farming all these you can talk about in agriculture and when it comes to agro based industries you can say uh, first of all every uh, village needs to be provided with electricity for industries to be able to run then you can set up cottage industries then food processing industries when it comes to food processing industry um, i remember we had discussed an example of a farmer producer organization called as aladangadi fpo uh, in karnataka which uh, in which uh, the 
uh, the farmers had uh, formed this uh, they had formed this fpo and uh, the fpo had marketed uh, jams pickles papad out of the fruits that were going waste because of the lockdown so uh, you can cite the importance of fpos and also uh, i remember in one of the uh, discussions we had uh, talk spoken about the post harvest losses so which uh, stood at more than 92000 crore of post harvest losses happen in india every year so this is again that is why it is important to have food processing industry so you can talk about women self help groups and how they can come together and uh, participate in income generating activities then when you talk about uh, transportation and construction so again transportation is important because we need to provide the last mile uh, connectivity uh, for whatever product that is manufactured in the village will have to reach a wider market in the urban areas similarly construction you can construct warehouses and other logistics and for these things transportation and construction you can leverage the government schemes like mg narega so that will uh, first of all give employment immediately to people at the same time it is also creating some community durable assets also so when it comes to services again in that health and education is very important where technology can be used like e health and e technology all of these can be used at per education um, there is also a suggestion that we need to train local teachers so that uh, local employment is also created and education is also uh, given in a qualitative manner to the uh, people in the village so all of these things apart from these you must also think uh, beyond these sectors for instance uh, several villages have these uh, traditional skills or uh, traditional handicrafts so these will have to be encouraged for example uh, the mithila art is there the worli painting is there so these are traditional skills which will have to be encouraged for example uh, we had discussed about the um, what is the name of that tribe todas ha toda tribes uh, who are making embroidered masks and now they are making masks because there is no market but before they were uh, having this unique toda embroidery on shawls and other cloths materials and they were selling it to a global market so we had seen this case study if you remember in one of the classes so you can talk about uh, reviving these traditional skills and handicrafts for instance uh, several regions several rural areas have unique weaving so this cloth weaving also we had uh, discussed about uh, one particular website which is directly selling the product of these weavers uh, to an international market even the national and international market so we can come up with those online platforms where the work of these traditional craftsmen could be sold similarly many are um very good at uh, some unique jewelries so these again can be marketed so we can come out with this idea of one district one product so in all the villages in that particular district they have their own unique strengths so one district one product is based on uh, the thailand's one tambon one product example so popularizing one particular uh, niche product for every uh, uh, cluster of villages so that can also help in revival of the rural economy similarly you can talk about rural tourism also so whether it is a local cuisines or the folk music and the folk artists so now there is a lot of demand for all these things you can talk about that then you can talk about the role of technology in uh, reviving the rural economy so with telehealth and uh, direct benefit transfer tele education all of these things you can talk about the role of um, technology and most importantly is the institutional empowerment empowering the pris is a key step towards reviving the rural economy so there has to be more decentralization uh, better accountability on part of the pris and capacity building and training given to uh, the people who are who occupy offices in the pris and uh, better funding for the pris is again very important so on all these lines uh, you can cover your answer so in the answer you see that uh, several times i have referred to information that we have already covered in whether it is data of post harvest losses or whether it is the toda example or whether it is uh, the fpo example so so many things that you are seeing we have already covered before uh, so keep revising whatever you have learnt in the previous classes you have taken note of so the same information can be used in multiple answers and you can frame a good answer so today's question is uh, critically analyze india africa relations has a 10 mark a question for 150 words so utilize the next two days for uh, revision
see all on monday again thank you